have the great pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for the day. Uh, he is a lead engineer of SUI blockchain at Misten Labs. And prior to Misten Labs, he was an engineering leader of the programming languages and runtimes organization at MITA. His research has been published in top tier computer architecture and programming languages, uh, in programming language conferences with best paper awards. And he's here today to explain to us the innovation and challenges when building SUI, the next generation blockchain. So everyone, please join me in welcoming in OpenCoff, all the way from California, United States, our keynote speaker, Shun Li. Welcome, Shun. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, right, cool, works. All right, shall I start? Yes. Okay. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. It's my great honor to be here and talk about what we're working on at Mission Labs. Uh, Mission Labs is a startup founded last year. Uh, we're building a new layer one public blockchain called Sui. Some of you might already be thinking, oh no, not another blockchain. Uh, well, I promise you, at the end of this talk, you'll be convinced that Sui is not just another blockchain. It means a lot to me to be able to come here uh, to Greece um, two of our uh, two, two of our co-founders from Mission Labs are actually from Greece. We also uh, recently opened two offices in Greece, and one of them is right here in Athens. Um, so it's very excited for me to to come here and visit our uh, Athens office, and also uh, meet my lovely colleagues. Um, so our our vision at Mission Labs is to provide the infrastructure for the next billion users in Web3. So what is Web3? To us, Web3 is an era of digital ownership. In the past few decades, we have seen a very rapid and massive development in the internet from Web1, Web where everyone can read and consume information, to Web2, where everyone can now participate and contribute their own content and we have seen amazing advancement in technology in that process. However, somehow we ended up in a situation where um, a small handful of companies now own most of the, own and control most of the user data and revenue distribution. And they're all closed ecosystems that hold back innovation from independent developers. The economic interests of these big internet platforms are not well aligned with the interest of their most valuable contributors, the users. And at the center of that, the root problem is that users do not own their own data. To see a few examples, let's look at social network. Your social data, your social profile, is not owned by you, it's owned by the platform. And it's locked in a platform, which means that you have no say or no decision making um, to control how your data is being used. And if your social data is really valuable and they are able to monetize, you're not going to get a cut. And more importantly, you're not able to take your data out um, to use it in different platforms. Similar problem exists in content platforms, um, such as YouTube, TikTok. Um, content provide creators, they, they make the hard work, they create content, they give it to the platform. The platform is able to monetize using that content and they're going to take most of the profit. The creators are only get a small cut because they don't own the data. They have no say in the process of monetization. And similarly in games. The game assets you have in the games, they are owned and controlled by the game platform. Unless the game provides a native way to support it, it is impossible for you to say, take your assets out of the game and use it for exchanges or move it to other games or even to the metaverse. So all of these problems come to the same root, which is users, we do not own our data. The data are owned and locked in by the platforms. Oops, sorry. And if we think about it, take a moment to picture. What would happen if, let's say, users own their own data and users can choose 
how their data interacts with different platforms and products. With that, then we're forcing a much more fair and competitive way for companies to decide how the data are going to be monetized. And more importantly, these data are going to be able to freely transfer and exchange among different platforms. That, and also coupled with the trend where more and more our life is moving from physical to digital, now we're creating a massive opportunity to have a global internet interconnected platforms that are centered around user data. User data can move freely among games, social networks, uh, marketplaces, financial institutions, and it is a massive market, a massive opportunity, and that is a foundation for metaverse. So that's Web3. Web3 is not a new web. It's not metaverse. It's not just crypto, NFT, DeFi. Um, these are just applications. Web3 is a fundamental change in the relationship among users, their data, aka digital assets, and the platforms and products. And this is the direction we're moving uh, towards, towards a society. Now, to properly support Web3, we need infrastructure. And blockchain happens to provide many of the foundational properties that Web3 would need. Um, what is a blockchain? A blockchain is a decentralized state replication machine. You can think of it as a decentralized database where you have a, a bunch of individual uh, independent nodes. Uh, each of them st uh, stores a copy of the data that is stored on chain. And users interact with the blockchain with transactions. And these transactions are used to mutate the data. And all of these nodes have to be able to advance their state in a way that is consistent. Now, because it is decentralized, um, the data is not controlled or owned by a single unit. And this forces a, a fair and competitive market on how users can interact with their data with different platforms and products. It is also open network, meaning that every user can participate in the progress. They can interact with the, 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 the blockchain through transactions through a well-defined standard protocol. So any network, any platform, any product can easily plug in to the blockchain as long as they follow that same standard. It's like the web standard today. And most importantly, it supports programmable assets that are authenticated through cryptography. This is why sometimes we call blockchain crypto. It's because of this. We use cryptography to prove the ownership of digital assets. Now, these are the basic properties that Web3 needs, but it's not enough to become an infrastructure for Web3. So what are some of the most important properties that infrastructure Web3 will need? And we believe that these two are the most important and missing properties that a proper infrastructure Web3 will demand. Scalability and asset safety. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about scalability. You don't quite often hear this word in the blockchain industry. Um, you'll see why in a, few, in, in a few minutes. But the idea here is that if you're building a, say, Web2 company today, uh, if you're building an infrastructure for, say, rebuilding Facebook or Google, you're not going to think about what is my maximum throughput, what is my maximum ability to store data. Because if the demand is 1 million users, you will build enough servers to support 1 million users. If the demand becomes 1 billion users, you will scale up the system to support 1 billion users. So the, the critical key here is that the system, if it works, has to be able to scale up based on the demand, based on the need. So the elasticity of the ability to handle input, handle demand, is the key here. And that is what's, what scalability is. And most of the blockchains today are not really toward, trending towards this direction. And the second property is asset safety. In Web3, everything has ownership. They all have value. So all the data become assets, digital assets. So it is crypto that, crit, critical that the platform, the infrastructure, should provide native support for asset safety. Now let's take a look at how typical blockchain today uh, um, perform in these two areas and how we are going to solve the challenges we're facing. In today's blockchains, um, as I explained earlier, we can think of it as a decentralized database, and each database contains a state of the blockchain. 
And by sending transactions, you advance the state from one to another. Now, because all these nodes in the blockchain are decentralized, they're independent, we have to make sure that all these nodes are mutating their state in a way that is consistent. Now, to most of the, uh, from the point of view of transactions today, the current blockchain storage is more like a black box. It's a global shared storage, where when you have two transactions, you have no idea if they're going to touch the same place in storage or not. They might, they might not, which means that there's potential data rates among every transaction that are sent to the blockchain. And because of that, in order to ensure consistency in the, in the data mutations, most of blockchains today is designed in an architecture like this, where after a transaction is, is validated, it has to first go through a consensus engine to provide a deterministic and total ordering of all the transactions in the world. And after that, you have to then execute them and commit them in sequence. Well, there's optimizations you can make, but in the end, you have to make sure the commitment are done in order to make sure every node, every value in the system are progressing in the same way. And in the end, there's also um, the need to create blocks to update the root of Merkle trees. All of these are synchronized op op operations that take time, expensive, and are in the critical path of transaction execution. Now, if you ever worked on a database before or deal with large-scale data systems and you look at this architecture, you'll be laughing. Like, how in the world can this ever scale, right? There's fundamental limitation in um, the scalability of the system because everything has to eventually come to a sequence, right? There's no way for this to scale. You can optimize however you want, but it is not scalable. And we believe that to make the infrastructure Web3, it should scale exactly the same like Web2. That is, your design should allow you to simply add more cores or more machines or more data centers to support more throughput. And the infrastructure for Web3 must satisfy this property to become a potential candidate for the future. Now, let's look at how SWE achieve this potential with a unique object-centric data model. So, as we mentioned earlier, in traditional blockchains today, the storage is just a big, gigantic black box. However, in SWE, we model data as individual objects. You can think of these objects, similar concept to object-oriented programming, where any kind of encapsulated data entity can be thought as an object. For example, your, uh, your coin with the balance can be an object. Your stable coin with the balance can be an object. Each of your NFT can be an object. And if you're building, for example, a Twitter on the blockchain, any your, your tweet, each of your tweet is object. A follow relationship can be object. Anything that you can define with the semantics and can be wrapped uh, with a few data, data fields will become an object. And the storage in three blockchain is really just a, a gigantic pool of all of these individual objects keyed by their unique IDs. And each of these objects has owner. Some objects are owned by me, some objects are owned by you. Some objects can be accessed by anyone, so they're shared. Now, in order to send a transaction in the three blockchain, you specify which object this transaction is going to operate on. For example, let's say if you're going to transfer some money, transfer some tokens, all you need to do is to specify your um, uh, three token object in the transaction with the recipient address. And that's how this transaction figure out, okay, this is a coin I'm gonna touch. I'm not gonna touch any other objects that you own. Now, with this in mind, we have a very, very nice property here where for any validator, when it sees any transaction, it can statically figure out if two transactions have dependency or not simply by looking if they have any overlapping objects. For example, in this case, transaction one mutates object one, and transaction two mutates object two and three. It is obvious that these two transactions touch different objects, and they are not overlapping, so they can completely be executed in parallel, and not only executed in parallel, but also committed to the storage in parallel. 
And this is what we call causal ordering, uh, because we do not require all transactions to be ordered, which is total ordering. Transactions only need to be ordered when they're touching the same object. And that's the causal order. So if you look at things this way, then we have some very, very interesting consequences. We actually don't have blocks. We cannot create blocks because all of these independent, non-overlapping transactions are being executed and committed and finalized in parallel. And we cannot stop, or there's no way to stop somewhere and say, hey, these transactions are going to be in this order, and they're going to be in the next block. We can't do that, and we don't want to do that, because to do that, we have to stop the world, we have to sequence things again, then we have to, to do all those expensive updates. So we actually do not create blocks in the process. You can think of every object, it's a blockchain by itself. And it is chained and connected by the transactions that are touching that object and advancing on its own, independently. Now, how do we scale the system? Well, when there are more applications, more users, we simply will have more objects. And to be able to process more objects, we simply add more cores and more workers to more machines to process those objects. So we can achieve the same kind of property that Web2 companies can scale their system here by simply paralyzing all the transactions that are touching different objects and have multiple machines and cores to process these different objects. This is what we call horizontal scalability. And what's more, we just talk about that transactions that touch the same object have to be ordered. Now, we had a further realization that there are actually two kinds of objects in the world. There are what we call owned objects. There are objects owned by an individual account, such as your tokens, your NFTs, your game assets, whatever that's only owned by you. And then there's shared objects. Objects are, can be accessed by anyone, usually in a way that is, for example, competitive. We have like the uh, decentralized exchanges, NFT marketplaces. These things will need to be shared because everyone needs to be accessed at the same time. We realize that we only need consensus for the shared object transactions. That is, transactions are touching shared objects. Because only for those transactions, you can have many users trying to, to touch at the same time, so you have to use consensus to provide a deterministic and unique order of these transactions. For the transactions that are only touching own objects, like me transferring my own money, it actually does not require consensus. We can simply have the client, usually the SDK or the wallet, decide the order of how you want to transfer, send transactions that touch your own objects. So we essentially are able to bypass consensus for a large percentage of transactions in the world because many of the transactions today are actually token transfers or object transfers. And in the future, maybe game asset uh, manipulations are only touching own objects. So this is quite exciting. We're looking at a blockchain that actually does not create blocks and may or may not use consensus in its critical path. By doing so, we eliminate most of the typical bottleneck in the ability to scale the system in the process. And that unlocks unlimited upper bound on scalability. So this is the core, kind of core innovation of how SWE works through this object-centric data model. The other property that we talk about is asset safety. You probably see these news almost every other day these days, right? Some smart contract get compromised, some bridge get hacked, uh, some people's money gets stolen. Um, there's so many vulnerabilities today in the smart contract. And many have now started to believe that the fundamental bottleneck that's holding back a lot of innovations in, for example, DeFi and some of the other uh, uh, D apps and applications is a lack of the ability to program uh, digital assets primitively and natively in a safe way. So what programming language should be used to program assets? Well, if we look at how you know, Web2 gets really, really popular, a large part of the contributor and, and the key element is the provenance of JavaScript. When you have a JavaScript error in the web page, you refresh it. 
it's okay, not a big deal. But if you have an error in a smart contract, when you're dealing with smart digital assets that has value or sometimes have huge amount of value, you cannot tolerate errors like that. So that may not be the best language for programming digital assets, right? So what should a good language do um, to be able to fit for Web3? We believe that a very good language for Web3 should really model digital assets primitively so that you, instead of rely on some raw data manipulations or bits by its changes to play with digital assets, digital assets are a primitive part, a native part of the language. You can define native types to represent digital assets. And the ownership is part of the system, part of the protocol, not something you have to manually write in a big map, which is like what mostly, uh, most other languages do today. More importantly, we have to take advantage of modern type systems to make it really, really hard for users to make mistakes. And there's a big, very good reason for many, for example, many of the system programmers these days are moving from C, C++ to Rust. It's because it provides you a nice property on memory safety and thread safety. And we believe that smart contract and digital asset programming share many of the same properties as system programming, or even more than that. So we need a modern, lang modern type system that makes sure we cannot or very hard to make mistakes like those. And finally, many financial related smart contract applications, they have to go through very careful auditing to make sure they're really bulletproof. It is very hard to hack them. To do that, the language has to provide a native way to verify uh, the, the, the functionality of the system through formal verification. So it has to be easy to reason about and verify. These are what we believe are the must for a good programming language for Web3. To achieve this, we have been working on a next generation smart contract language called Move. Move, similar and inspired by Rust, we use linear types to prevent misuse of asset values, meaning that you cannot easily, you cannot duplicate your assets, you cannot copy, you cannot double spend, and you cannot accidentally drop it or destruct it. We also have native asset types that you can use to define structurally as the object types to create the objects we just mentioned. And all the fields are native. Everything is native. And finally, it's co-developed with the move prover so that you, when you finish writing a smart contract or program, you can actually define specifications of the properties you want this application to enforce. And then you can run through the move prover tool to verify that these specifications are actually true. So this is what we believe are the must have of the next generation of smart contract for language. And we aim to achieve this through move. Now we have covered the core innovations of SWE. We use object-centric data model to achieve unbounded scalability. We create a new language, called, uh, smart contract language called Move to achieve asset safety. Now let me share some of the challenges that both us and industry are facing in making blockchain more mainstream and how we deal with them. And the first one is interesting one. What about blocks? Block is both a bless and curse for blockchains. It's a black speak because it does provide you a very nice way of looking at all the transaction history in a deterministic order. If you're building, for example, a ether scan or an explorer, you want to just look at all the history of transactions, you want to see them in one order, not a random order. If you're building like a services, like um, auditing service, where you want to process every transaction, look at result, make sure they are consistent, you also need a way to know what order they're coming in and also creates a way of being efficient. You process bulk transfer transactions instead of individual, individual ones. But also having to create blocks in the critical paths adds extra overhead. It makes it fundamentally unscalable. We already talked about in SWE, we do not create blocks in the critical paths. But we still want to provide these nice properties where traditional services or today's blockchain services want something like blocks. So what we do 
is we create something called checkpoints after the fact with zero latency overhead. When transactions are being executed and finalized, they're still done in a way that is non-blocking. No blocks are being created. You know, everything is done in parallel. In this case, we have one, two, three transactions that are executed in parallel, and then we have four or five, and then six, seven, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing changes here. However, we have a side process that almost you can think of runs offline that use consensus protocol to, for validators to agree on, okay, since the last period of time, what are the transactions we have executed so far? And we put these transactions into something we call a checkpoint. And these checkpoint then create a chain just like blocks in blockchain. They include all the transactions that are done in every period of time. And if just looking at the chain of checkpoints, you're able to see all the transactions in the history in a unique and globally agreed order. By doing so, not only we have a way that everybody expects blockchain to, to, to behave and to have a nice way of looking at transactions, but more importantly, we avoid the latency in the process of actually creating blocks. Another typical challenge that industry faces is asset safety in wallets. Last year, I spent a lot of time trading NFTs. Um, it's fun, um, but also it's very, very scary. When you go and mint an NFT on a website, what happens is you go there, you connect the website to your wallet, and there's usually a button that says mint. By clicking that button, you basically be authorizing a transaction that will be sent to the, um, to the blockchain. And if everything goes correctly, um, after you click that button, the transaction will be sent, it will be executed, and you hopefully have an NFT in your wallet. Or if that website turns out to be a scam website, and after clicking that button, you lose everything in your wallet. It's a very scary moment. And everyone who enters this industry for the first time probably have to be spammed once or twice in their life. And that's ridiculous. There's no way this could go mainstream with even people who are in this industry or understand how things work can still be vulnerable to all the attacks and spams. And the root of this problem is when you're approving a transaction in your wallet, there's no way for you to know what this transaction is going to do to your assets, right? Is it going to give you an NFT? Or is it going to transfer away all your monies? You never know. And this is the same problem we had earlier when we look at the transactions treating the storage as a global shared black box, right? They could be touching anywhere in that black box, and you have no way to know in advance. SWE provides a very unique way of solving this problem. Because remember that in SWE, we partition the wallets, we partition the storage in the form of individual objects. And when you send a transaction, the transaction can operate on these individual objects. And what's more, when you specify the objects in the transaction, you also have to specify how you want to use those objects. Are you going to only read these objects? Are you going to write it? Or are you going to transfer it away? All of these are statically specified in the transaction. Because of that, if you're running, if you're proving a transaction in three blockchain on the wallet, the wallet can actually tell you exactly which object this transaction is going to touch. It will tell you, hey, you're going to spend this token, you're going to transfer away this NFT, or you will not transfer away anything. We might give you something. All of these, you can see that statically from the wallet. So we hope that the experience of using a sweet wallet can be similar to something like when you're installing applications, say, on Android. It may not be the best example, but when you install something on an app, it tells you exactly what permissions it will be granting to. Right? Is it going to touch the network? Is it going to make phone calls? Is it going to access your contact? We'll do the same thing for SWE, except even better, even more fine-grained, down to the level of individual objects. And hopefully by doing that, we can actually take blockchain to the mainstream. We can take many interesting applications and financial applications to the, main to the mainstream 
by having people really get into and understanding how the security model works and whether they're having any risk when they're interacting with the wallet. The next challenge I want to talk about is gas fees. Gas fee is something very interesting, uh, unique in the blockchain. When you send a transaction, someone or the validators are going to need to process them, and it costs electricity to process them. So you have to pay them to do so. And that's the payment is called gas fee. Now, if you're sending a transaction in Ethereum today, how is your gas fee determined? Well, it is determined based on the current traffic in the whole network. For example, if there is, say, for example, a, a very high demand or popular NFT mint somewhere in the world, and you're trying to send your tokens to your own wallet, you have to pay very high gas fees. That's almost if, say, you're going to the office in the morning, there's uh, somewhere on the other side of the world in Los Angeles, there's a big traffic on the road, and you also have to be stuck on the road for an hour in order to go to the office because of that. That's ridiculous, right? You're not supposed to pay for something that traffic is not caused by you. And the root of this problem is still the same thing. It's the blockchain is trying to order, globally order, every single transaction in the world. So it doesn't matter what applications you're touching, you're using. You're part of that global transaction set. So you have to pay the cost, even if you're not the one causing the traffic. And again, SWE has a unique opportunity to solve this challenge. Transactions can be grouped based on what object they're touching. For example, if I'm only transferring my token, then I'm only touching my own object. Nobody else is going to compete with me. But if I'm, say, trying to participate in a very popular NFT mint, where a million people is all trying to participate and mint at the same time, and trying to access that same object at the same time, OK, then there's high traffic on that object, and it is a very hot object. So we're willing to pay a little more fee to be able to offset that surge in traffic, and also maybe get a higher chance of winning the competition. So by doing so, we can have partition the network based on which object you're operating on, and we can group transactions depending on what object they're touching. And these are, can be independent processed by different workers. And you should only need to pay higher gas if you're touching a very hot object, an object that everybody else is also trying to touch and access at the same time. But if you're just, just doing token transfers, you know, it doesn't matter. It should always be low gas fee because nobody is ever um, competing with you. I still remember when I was, um, sometimes when I was transferring my own Ethereum to my other wallets, I have to be careful what time I'm doing it. And I remember there's something like, there's one day during the week at 2 a.m. in the morning, you really get the lowest gas fee. So sometimes I have to not sleep, wait for that moment, and send my transaction. It's kind of ridiculous. And that will never happen with the model in SWE, where all the transactions can be grouped based on what objects they're touching. And the gas fee will depend on the hotness of the objects that are used in the transactions. So these are some of the interesting challenges that we're all facing in the industry and how we are tackling them. To wrap up, we have go through all the core properties and innovations of SWE. And our goal, our vision, is to build the next generation Web3 infrastructure for the next billion users. SWE uses object-centric data model to scale and to allow unlimited parallelization of transaction processing. And it allows you to model digital assets as native objects. And this is how we can achieve horizontal scaling. By putting more, more machines, more cores, you're able to achieve higher throughput. We're also working on a new program language called Move that allows you to safely interact and program digital assets. And finally, we've gone through many different challenges that, that all blockchains are facing, and how SWE provides a very unique opportunity to solve these challenges. And that concludes my talk.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have uh, now very, uh, we have many questions for you Great. from the audience. So but I get to ask the first one, right? Okay. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> if I may. So soon, soon actually it is, right? Um, okay, so um, I guess the first question uh, that comes into my mind, uh, listening to all this interesting uh, information. Uh, yesterday we had a very interesting uh, uh, speech about security in the cloud and in general, in the digital world. So uh, Dimitris Patsos was the one that was giving this speech. I don't know if you had the chance to uh, listen to it, but basically one of the key points was that attackers these days they focus more on uh, attacking the identity of the users rather than attacking firewalls or uh, information systems in a central uh, manner. So I guess the question is, how do we protect identity uh, in the digital world where all our assets and you know, they're very valuable to every single one of us, um, how do we protect them and how do we protect our identity? Maybe through the platform that you're introducing. And uh, also, um, could NFT identity be the answer to that? Any of the, could any of, what's the last question? The NFT identity. Using an NFT as an identity um, way of uh, being, you know, a unique object that identifies you on the digital world and giving you access to your resources, assets, etc. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. It's actually a very, very big topic. Identity okay. is uh, something everybody is thinking about these days. And I'll start with your last question. And I think these days there's already a lot of uh, innovative projects that are being worked on to uh, unlock, say, membership or identity using NFTs. So definitely that's one way to do it. And because of cryptography, you can prove that you own certain NFTs and hence you prove who you are. Uh, but I think that's just part of the puzzle because at the end of the day, it's still kind of anonymous. So it depends on what level of identity you're talking about. Um, this may, not, may or may not be the answer you want. I think what NFT give you is more of a permission. It, it gives you a proof of permission to do something or to have access to something. Um, but at the end of the day, it probably does not exactly represent your identity. I think in the end, to have a good identity um, solution, it has to be a solution that works together between regulation, governments, um, and uh, innovation companies to really have all these solutions put together. So you can't have an end-to-end -end chain from, you know, some, ultimately some uh, trust of source to know who you really are to how you represent it and transfer that and use it in different uh, blockchain and platforms. Um, that's probably my, my rough thoughts. Yeah, it, I guess it's in the process of having a, a, a who you are and uh, what you have uh, approach into authentication. Yes. So, yeah, I, can, I guess it could be a part of the process of the authentication. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but definitely the introduction and pavilions of using cryptography mm -hmm. is definitely a big, big step in, towards that mm -hmm. process. Because yes, in the past, you can claim whoever you want and just by saying or by social engineering and mm -hmm. by other means. Um, today, you actually have to pro provide cryptography uh, proof and that is impossible to get unless you steal someone's private key, um, which is the real problem. And we have to figure out how do we then provide uh, protection and, and storage to make sure that people's private keys are not being stolen and not being um, misused. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, we can ask? Yeah, yeah, we can uh, go to the questions uh, because, okay, we have uh, <coughs> many from the audience and it's good to reply them. So uh, what makes Swiss stand out from uh, similar projects? Let's say, for example, Solana. Uh. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I'm not going to start a war here uh, between Swiss and Solana. I think uh, all projects are very innovative, and they're all uh, serving their role, and they're all making great progress in the right direction. Um, I wouldn't, however, say they're similar projects. Um, again, the, the mission for SWE is not just to achieve high throughput which is, I think, what everybody to these days are trying to race towards, is to how, you know, how to make optimizations here and there to come up with clever 
consensus algorithms to somehow make the super larger and larger and squeeze that juice a bit more. Um, we're not in that, really in that race. We're thinking about how the system actually can scale. Um, and we have showed that by dividing the storage into individual objects and allow transactions that touching different objects can uh, be done completely in parallel, we provide unlimited potential for scalability. And I don't think that's anything, that's some, I don't think that's something any blockchain today are providing, including Solana. And I do not think Solana has a story of infinite scalability. Um, that, that's my brief take. And plus, not, if, you ask, if you go around and ask people, nobody really understands um, how their consensus works. It's uh, still a mystery to me. Okay. So to move to our uh, next question, um, since uh, you mentioned checkpoints that eventually create a linear order of transactions, does this mean that some sort of rollback is required to properly order conflicting transactions? And if so, at what point is transaction finally achieved? Very good question. So first of all, there are not going to be any conflicting transactions, and here's why. Um, let's look at the two different cases. In the first case, let's say transactions are touching shared objects. If you have a transaction that's touching shared objects, those transactions actually always go through consensus before being executed. So consensus will determine um, deterministically and, and globally uniquely what order these transactions are going to be executed on. And there's not, never going to be conflict. They'll be executed in the order specified by the consensus engine. And so the outcome is always going to be consistent among validators. Now, the case of own object is more interesting because, as we said before, if I'm transferring my own token, that transaction actually does not go through consensus at all. So how do we make sure there's no conflicting transactions? The way we do this is when you, we, we divide the transaction processing phase into two steps. In the first step, as a client, let's say I want to transfer my token. I figure out the latest version of my token object. I sign that transaction. I say I want to transfer this object. I sign it. And I must send it to two-thirds of all validators. And then all these validators that receive this transaction, they will look at it. They will see, do I have a conflicting transaction in play that's already going on? If not, then I will sign this transaction and I will lock that object into the transaction that's specified there. And once you have two-thirds of signatures from validators, then you can form something we call certificate. With the certificate, you know that it is impossible for anyone, including yourself, to be able to create a conflicting certificate that try to use the same object for different transactions. And then you send this certificate again to all validators, and each validator will then be able to uh, execute the certificate, advance the object to the next version, and unlock it. By doing so, there can never be like conflicting transactions that are both committed. It can never happen. So by the time they're executed, it, they, they, will, they will not be conflicting. Now, what is the uh, criteria for finality? It's also a very good question because you know, in most blockchains, finality is when you, uh, first of all, you have to get in the block, and two, in, 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 depending on the chain you're looking at, sometimes you have to wait for certain uh, like height, uh, longest height to be confirmed, and it's actually probabilistic, it's not deterministic. In SWE, because we don't have blocks, you know, all the validators are just committing and executing transaction in, in, independently in parallel. The moment that we can say this transaction is finalized is when two-thirds of the validators have all executed this transaction. Now, this is a tricky to kind of observe, but if you're the person sending the transaction, you can actually wait there until you collect uh, two-thirds of those commits, say, I have executed a transaction, and you get a certificate of execution. That's the point you can say, OK, my transaction is finalized. That's the earliest point you get to know your transaction is definitely finalized, and nothing else can, can go on. If you're more patient, and you, or you don't want to go into trouble to wait and to you know, see 
who has executed, who has not. You can also wait for a checkpoint. When a transaction is included in a checkpoint, it is also guaranteed to already have finalized because we only put transaction into a checkpoint if it has already been executed by two thirds of the validators. Um, I hope that answers the question. Do we have time for uh, one more question? Because we have a lot. Um, so how challenging is two objects to make transactions with each other? Because you need support uh, each object with all other objects in the blockchain, like in the real world, that each entity can make transactions with every possible entity. Is this possible to be coded? Yes, so we, we introduced many different forms of connecting different objects uh, in the system. To give a few examples, um, when, when you're, say, you're dealing with your own objects, we actually can create a tree of objects where objects can have child objects and child objects can have its own child objects. And you don't have to specify all of them at once in order to operate on them. All you need to do is specify the, your, the root object in the transaction and you can actually dynamically load those different child objects while you're running the smart contract. And if you're dealing with, say, objects from different entities, then one transaction is not going to work. Typically, to do that, you have to interact with some commonly shared uh, shared object, and everyone interact with that, uh, that object to be able to make progress. So I believe the answer is yes. We, we definitely will be able to encode um, every possible interaction uh, through very small set of objects. In fact, we have found that express, expressiveness of our move language that I want to deal with objects is actually very high because of the composability of the language and because the, the ability to put objects in hierarchy and reference to each other. Um, there's probably a lot more details I'm not covering, so if, if this still sounds confusing or not answering or explaining well, please talk to me uh, after the talk. I'll be around all day uh, today here to answer the questions as well. Okay. Thank you. And one Thanks. last silly coin real estate? I do not know. Well, I cannot <laughs> say, at least. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank, much. You. Yeah. Thank you very Thank you. much for yeah. your insightful presentation. A great keynote speech. Thank you. So really much. appreciate yeah. coming here uh, to Athens. Oh. This is for you. A special you. gift for Thank you. you. Thank and, you. Thank you very uh, much. We're very excited that Mystery Labs is becoming part of the digital ecosystem of Greece. Yeah. Thank so, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.